This is the first in a series of ten lectures on the gospel stage. That account of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ is given by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do you know that scientists have estimated that since the time of Adam, some 40 billion people have lived or are living upon this earth? And as one studies anthropology, he is amazed at the various cultures and languages and customs, etc., involved in these uh, 40, or in, in uh, I should say this, that these 40 billion people have been involved with all these cultures and religions. But isn't it amazing to stop and think that the eternal destiny of these 40 billion people, not to speak of their philosophy here on earth, depends exclusively on their relationship to one individual, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says that concerning these 40 billion people, he that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. And so this, the tenth stage in the Bible and the first stage in the New Testament, there are only three, as you remember, there were nine in the Old, and we have the Gospel stage and the uh, Book of Acts, the early church stage, and then the Epistle stage. but. Of these 12 stages, without a doubt, this will be the most important one, because without Jesus, we'd have no Bible and we'd have no plan of salvation. It has been rightly said that our Lord did not come upon this earth to preach the gospel, although he did that, but that wasn't the main reason. Jesus came that there might be a gospel to preach. The Son of Man has come to seek and save, and that's the gospel, that which was lost. And in your notes, you can read the introduction itself. And let me say that basically what we're attempting to do here in these nine next following nine lectures is not so much to <clears throat> take a biography of his life, for actually the Gospels does not, do not give us a biography, <clears throat> but more or less a synopsis of the last three years of his life. For example, there are 89 chapters, as you figure out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Adam, all of 89 chapters. And of these 89, <clears throat> only three or four tell us that information concerning the first 30 years of his life. And of the 89, 16 or 17 chapters are given over to those events in the last few days of his life. So it really isn't a biography that we shall now be studying of the, of the life of Christ, what he did uh, when he was six years old and when he started to school and, and when he uh, did this and that, because we're not told those things. What it is now is a... A brief examination, really, of the last three years of his life, particularly the last one week of that life. And that's the gospel presentation by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We suggested in our notes that Jesus Christ is certainly a very misunderstood person. Of all the 40 billion people, I doubt if ever an individual ever appearing, appearing on this earth, has been the subject of more misunderstanding than the Savior. He's misunderstood by the liberals. He's misunderstood by the cults. And you notice here in our induction, we suggest to you that he is also misunderstood by Bible believers, the reason being that we stress his death so much in an attempt to get away from the liberal concept speaks of his life, that uh, we don't understand really these events in his life. But as we suggest in our scripture references here, 
his life is to be studied as well as his death because our Lord has provided us an example that we should follow his steps. That is to say, we should study his life. And so you'll find the uh, various steps that he took, some 72 in nature, beginning with his first step from glory to Bethlehem and then winding up after a glorious three-year ministry, his final step from Bethlehem, or from the Mount of Olives back to glory from whence he came. From glory to glory, the glory story of the Savior of all men. Now, by uh, saying these few, first few words, let me begin by asking you now, if you have not done so already, to turn to the genealogy as recorded by Matthew, the genealogy in Matthew's gospel. And by the way, and we'll get to this a little later, except let me review now, or let me summarize what we're going to say about the four gospel accounts. Someone has said that, that the three synoptic gospels, which would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke, give us a presentation of the life of Christ the Gospel of John gives us an interpretation of that life. And uh, I think it's interesting to note that you find two genealogies in these four Gospel accounts. Matthew has a genealogy and Luke has a genealogy. Mark does not and the Gospel of John presents no genealogy. And of course the answer is obvious as one understands the background here. Matthew pictures him as a king, and a king must have a genealogy. Luke pictures him as the perfect man, and a perfect man should have a genealogy. Mark describes him as a servant, and a servant has no need of a genealogy. John writes of him as the mighty God, and God has no genealogy. When I first got saved and started reading the Word of God, I came to these genealogies and I had a tendency, as most of us do, to sort of skip over them uh, because uh, I thought, oh, oh, here's another bushel full of begets, as it were. But I want to tell you in these first few verses of Matthew 1, there is gold in them thar hills. I want you to notice now in chapter 1 of Matthew, that there are four women mentioned. One in verse 3 by the name of Tamar. And in verse 5 we have another woman mentioned whose name is Rahab, and then Ruth. And then in verse 6 we have Bathsheba. Now she's not mentioned in verse 6. It simply says uh, of the wife of Uriah. But we know that he's referring here to Bathsheba. Now, this is an amazing thing, and not only in most Mid-Eastern chronology records do you not find a woman mentioned, and that's one unusual thing here, but these are immoral women, at least women with questionable background. For example, Tamar uh, was a prostitute. Tamar was the daughter-in-law of Judah. And in Genesis 38, you can read that rather sordid account of how she entices her own father-in-law to come into her tent and to commit fornication. And yet here she is now in this genealogy leading to Christ. And then you have Rahab, who was known as Rahab the harlot until her glorious conversion there in, in, uh, in uh, uh Joshua chapter 2, I started to say Jericho chapter 2. She was in the city of Jericho. You have Ruth, who certainly was not an uh, immoral woman as far as we know, uh, but she was a pagan girl, a paganess, until she repeated those beautiful words, Thy God shall be my God, thy people my people, and where you go I'll go, when she said those words to Naomi. But she had a very uh, paganistic background as far as uh, the Bible is concerned. And then Bathsheba uh, was, of course, an immoral person 
at least on one occasion, <clears throat> she was guilty of adultery because she slept with David uh, before her husband died and she was not married to David at the time, of course. So here you have a prostitute, you have uh, a harlot and a paganist and an adulterous wife, and yet all four respond to the grace of God and through this grace they find themselves mentioned in the genealogy of these names leading to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And I would suggest to you that this is one of the greatest examples in Matthew chapter 12 of the grace of God in all the Bible. Now, we also notice that not only is there a genealogy in the Gospel of Matthew, but there is one in the Gospel of Luke. And I am not going to read these names. You do have a brief summary in your notes of the difference between these two genealogies. The one in Luke, for example, is far more extensive, and it goes back further into history uh, than the one in Matthew. But I would like to say this, that most Bible theologians feel that the genealogy in Matthew is the genealogy of Joseph, the husband of Mary and the legal father, not the biological, mind you, but the legal father of Jesus, and that the genealogy in Luke is the genealogy of Mary. At any rate, we do know this, that in Matthew, the line goes through David, as it does in Luke, but it goes through David's son, Solomon. You see, David had several sons. Of course, the first one died, but then Solomon came along, and so the line now continues in Matthew's account through uh, Solomon, David's son, and it winds up with Joseph. So Joseph traces his ancestry back through Solomon to get to David. Now, in Mary, or in the situation here in Luke 3, we can't be absolutely positive on this, but many believe this is the genealogy of Mary, and Mary traces her ancestry back to another one of, through, I should say, another one of David's sons by the name of Nathan. Now, this is not the same Nathan the prophet that told David off during his terrible sin. In fact, uh, some believe that David named his son Nathan after Nathan the prophet. But at any rate, he had a boy named Nathan. And so here in the providence of God, after many, many years, you have a, a great, 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 great grandson, as it were, of King David through... Solomon marrying a great, 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 great granddaughter of David through Nathan by the name of Mary. So in the fullness of time, God has these two individuals, husband and wife, man and woman, both from the loins of David, but through different sons. All right, now, there is also of course, a preface, not a genealogy, but an introduction, as the genealogies are, in the Gospel of John. It is not a genealogy, but it is a preface. And someone has said, rightly so, that these first five verses in the Gospel of John are worthy to be written in gold. And let us briefly look at them. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. The life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness overcame it not. So we have also in the notes a summary of this preface in the Gospel of John. Now, what we'd like to do is spend some time in the three annunciations, the annunciation of these events leading up to the birth of Christ. Zechariah has one, and then uh, Mary is also visited, and her 
uh, part is announced that she'll play by the angel Gabriel, and then there's an annunciation made to Joseph, to, so to Zacharias and to Mary and to Joseph. Let me just say that in 1969, I believe it was, uh, <clears throat> President Richard M. Nixon uh, made a statement on nationwide TV <clears throat> that as Bible believers we could not accept. Someone had said he made a few after that that uh, very few people accepted too, and those were on tape, and he didn't know that we were going to hear those. But, but he made this nationwide statement, and here's what he said. <clears throat> he said, today is the greatest day in human history. Now, of course, the president was wrong. However, we understand the enthusiasm prompting him to make such a statement, because right before that, at 4.38 Eastern Daylight Savings Time uh, during that July exciting day in 1969, Neil Armstrong, for the first time in history, a man stepped foot on the moon. That was a great day in human history. It was not the greatest day. In fact, it wasn't the second, it wasn't the third, it wasn't the fourth greatest day. The fourth greatest day in human history took place some 2,000 years ago when a young virgin girl, perhaps uh, no more than 15, 16, 17, certainly probably no more than 18 or 19 years of age, gave forth birth to a baby boy and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. That's the fourth greatest day in human history. The third greatest day in human history, and we'll study this, of course, later on, took place some 30 uh, three years later, 34 years later, when this baby boy grew up to be a fine, outstanding man of God, and yet so uh, invoked the, or so incurred, I should say, the hatred of religious people that they concocted a, a kangaroo trial and put him to death between two thieves on a hill outside the city of Jerusalem. That was the third greatest day in human history. The second greatest day in human history took place some three days later when some angels told some women, ye women, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen from the dead. That's the second greatest day in human history. But the greatest and the most glorious and the grandest day in human history, Mr. Nixon, is yet to come to pass. And we read in Revelation, Revelation chapter 11 that upon the sounding of the seventh trumpet, then the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he shall rule and reign forever and ever. Amen. That's the greatest day in human history. But now I want you to notice some events with me concerned that lead up to the fourth greatest day in human history. The Annunciation, there are three of them now, the Annunciation, first of all, to Zacharias. And I would like for you, if you possibly can, because I'm going to point some, thing out that, some things out that are not in your notes, if you'll turn to Luke chapter 1. And we'll begin reading with verse 5. And that's where the event started that would lead up to the fourth greatest day in human history. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abijah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. So this old couple had a lot going for them. They were righteous before God. They were saved. They were walking in the commandments and ordinances. They enjoyed his fellowship of the Lord blameless. Now, it doesn't say sinless, but it means that they possess that spiritual maturity that God desires for his believers to possess. They loved the Lord, they loved each other, and the Lord loved them. But they had a heartache, they had a sorrow, they had a burden. We find that in verse 7. They, 
had no child. Because Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well, well stricken in years. Now today we know, of course, there are a number of reasons why couples cannot have children. But in those days it was looked down upon, a couple was looked down upon if they did not have a child, and it was inferred, if not actually uh, outright, uh, uh, you know, they were accused, if not outright uh, accusation, at least there was an inferral that uh, perhaps the, uh, the woman wasn't uh, really a full woman in the biological sense of the word, or if not that, perhaps God was withholding his blessing because of sin, and he was showing his displeasure. So it was a, it was a real tragedy not to have a child, especially if one was connected <clears throat> with the work of the Lord. Now, in verse 8, we read this statement, And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Now, in those days, of course, the temple was standing, and Jim Bishop has done some work on this, uh, The Day That Christ Died. I recommend that book for background material, and he says that the temple grounds and the temple buildings uh, was just a massive complex of buildings and, and that they occupied a place of maybe as much as one-third of a mile. So there were just, uh, it was an amazing sight to see the temple of God in those days. And, of course, this temple was destroyed by Titus in 70 A.D., and though in its day it was regarded as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and today I think if it were standing it would still be regarded as, a, as a, something that you just have to see. Well, you see, uh, there were at that time, there was at that time in Jerusalem approximately a population of around 250 to 300,000 people. And any one given day, Mr. Bishop brings out, in Jerusalem, there may have been as many as 100 to 150,000 visitors. So you add up the resident population with the visiting population, you may have as many as a half million people. Now, most of these people were pious, religious Jews, and they sacrificed and visited the temple. They loved the temple. And so you have tens of thousands of people pouring in and out each day in this gigantic temple. So there had to be, of course, hundreds and thousands of priests to minister to these tens of thousands of people. And they were divided into certain courses, some 24 divisions of priests, and they waited upon various things in the temple. They, some cleaned up after the sacrifices, some would offer the sacrifices, some would make sure that the temple of showbread, or that the table of showbread, was uh, in right order, and others that the candelabra was burning, and and they had various duties. But one of the most important duties, apart from the duty of the high priest once a year sacrificing during the day of Yom Kippur, but one of the apart from that, one of the most important duties uh, was the burning of incense upon the altar of incense, and a priest, regardless of how old or how uh, important he might be, his rank, or how experienced, he could only do this one time in his life. Now, he might offer sacrifices hundreds of times, but he can only, off he can only offer incense upon the altar of incense one time during his ministry. And as the story opens up here, and the events leading up to the fourth greatest day in human history, Zacharias is being allowed the privilege of doing this. Now, he's been around for many years, and he's preached, and he's prayed, and he's, and he's helped the people, and he's done many things in the temple, but he has never offered incense until today. We find from a historical study that they could only do this one time. So it's a very important day to him. Now, apparently we're not exactly sure how they did this, but 
the temple of the uh, altar of incense was uh, an altar, perhaps not much bigger than a communion table in a, in a church, and it was made of sheetum wood, acacia wood. And over this twisted, gnarled wood was laid a solid layer of gold. So it was a wooden table overlaid with gold. And uh, the top of it became known then as the altar top itself. And so on a given signal, uh, the priest would walk in carrying a censer in his hand. A censer looked sort of like our modern skillet that you cook eggs in. And he was carrying something, and some believe that he would carry it in his left hand. And uh, it wasn't eggs in the censer, but it was glowing coals of fire. And he would walk up to the Uh, to the altar of incense, and there was a bowl, uh, some Bible students think, a regular bowl on this altar of incense, and it had sweet-smelling perfume, frankincense and myrrh and and other things, uh, other powdery substances that that had a a sweet smell to it. And then he would dip into this bowl with his right hand, and he would sprinkle those coals of fire in this censer as you would sprinkle, perhaps as you're cooking your eggs, you would sprinkle salt upon it. And when the powder hit the flame, it would turn it in, vaporize it, and turn it into smoke, and it would fill the temple and the temple grounds with a sweet-smelling savor. And uh, this would uh, be the sign, and this would be the, the clue to the people outside waiting and uh, for the other worshipers and the priest working in the temple area, that prayer was being made and they were to remain in an attitude of prayer also because this was symbolic of prayer. You see, God was trying to stress and trying to point out to his people that he uh, looks upon our prayers, he views them as a sweet-smelling savor in his nostrils in heaven. And so Zechariah is about to do this now. Now in verse 10 we read, And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the time of incense. Now I don't know, but I have an idea that many of these people outside were friends and relatives and neighbors of Zechariah, Zacharias I should say, and Elizabeth. And they're all here to celebrate this occasion. And they probably got the cookies and the fruit cakes and the coffee and the, and the punch uh, awaiting outside and are at a certain, perhaps, uh, location. And as soon as he finishes and comes out and says the blessing, uh, then they're going to uh, rejoice and have him come over and celebrate this momentous occasion. But what he doesn't know at this time, and of course what they cannot know, is that there will be no uh, celebration as such after he comes out, because he's going to come out a little differently, quite differently than the way he went in. All right, verse 11, as he goes in, there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. He was terrified. Verse 13, But the angel said unto him, now in your Bibles you need to mark these next two uh, little words because they will appear no less than four times in these uh, events leading up to the fourth greatest day in human history. The two little words, fear not. Zacharias hears him here. Later on, a young virgin girl by the name of Mary will hear them. And then Joseph will hear those same words. And finally, some shepherds on a hillside will hear that beautiful uh, phrase, Fear not. The angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now here the angel makes a number of amazing prophecies to Zacharias, just shotgun fashion, one after uh, the other. Number one, 
your wife is going to bear you a child in her old age. Secondly, this child will be a boy. Thirdly, he shall be called John. Fourthly, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's going to have a great ministry. Fifthly, he shall be a Nazarite. And sixthly, he shall turn many Israeli hearts to God. Those great prophecies. Now, <clears throat> let me just take one for a moment and discuss that. He's going to be known as a Nazarite. Now, there is a difference in the Bible between a Nazarite and a Nazarene. Our Lord was a Nazarene, but he was not a Nazarite. A Nazarene was a person who was connected somehow with the city of Nazareth. And although our Lord was not born in Nazareth, he was born in Bethlehem, he lived in Nazareth and he was known as the Nazarene. But a Nazarite was a man or a woman, according to number six, who took upon himself a religious vow, had nothing to do concerning where he lived, but the vow that he took. And there were three things <clears throat> attached to this vow. Number one, he would not drink of the fruit of the vine. Secondly, he would not cut his hair. Thirdly, he would not touch a dead body, whether it was a human body or the body of an animal, for ceremonial purposes. Now, Jesus, as I stated before, was a Nazarene, but he was not a Nazarite. And I'm glad he wasn't a Nazarite because he loved to touch people. I've been a minister 18 years before I came to Thomas Road in 1972. We have six or 700 pastors taking this course. You know, gentlemen, you that are uh, pastors, I think you'll agree with this. Our Lord has given no instruction concerning how we ought to conduct a funeral because by way of example, he just raised him from the dead, didn't he? And he probably, you know, he said, well, I'm busy and you're busy and rather than to go through all this, why don't I just raise him up and we'll all have a cup of coffee and go home. And uh, so he did touch bodies. He came in contact with bodies. He was not a Nazarite. But this little baby named John is going to be a Nazarite. Verse 18, And Zechariah said unto the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. Why, well, I'm past, my wife is past the age of childbearing, and I'm an old man. How can this be? And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. Hey, listen, this is an important man, important angel, rather. His name is Gabriel. He's a biggie, as we would say today. He's one of the head honchos in heaven. There are two main angels mentioned by name in the Bible, archangels. One is Gabriel, and the other is Michael. So God is sending now one of the two five-star generals in heaven. This is a momentous occasion indeed. Now, verse 20, he says, Because you did not believe, behold, thou shalt be dumb. Now, literally, thou shalt be mute. You will not be able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Now, verse 21. I'm going to tell you something now, folks, so amazing, so astounding, so unbelievable that you just won't be able to apprehend it. Are you ready for this, uh, this uh, fantastic statement? Well, here it is. According to verse 21, many years ago, people got restless when the preacher didn't quit on time. Can you imagine that? 
Here he was uh, beyond the scheduled service by 5, 10, or 15 minutes, and they were looking at their watches and looking at their calendars perhaps, and, and I know that the people were saying, uh, well, you know, what in the world is he doing in there so long? Why, any other priest would be out 20 minutes ago. And the Bible says that they waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And the ladies were just sure that their lamb roast were burning and that, uh, that uh, the food was being overcooked. No, that statement isn't quite an amazing statement at all, is it? As far as people being concerned, if you take five minutes longer on Sunday morning. No, we're told that all of us are made in the same mold. Now, some of us, perhaps, are a little moldier than others but we're all in the same mold. And they were concerned in those days also if the preacher went five minutes over time. Now, finally he comes out. And you see, what they want him to do and what they are rightfully expecting him to do, he is to come out and give them the blessing. Now, in Numbers chapter 6, we have the formula that he was to use. Uh, We read these words uh, from God himself in the book of Numbers. Speak unto Aaron, God says, and unto his sons, saying, In this way ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. So they were waiting for him to come out and to repeat those blessed words. Well, he comes out all right, but he could not speak unto them, verse 22, and they perceived, and I don't know how he finally got them to realize by sign language, they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he made signs unto them and remained speechless. My wife likes this verse. She is the head of the uh, deaf department here at the Thomas Road Baptist Church, and she appears uh, regularly in that little circle on the old-time gospel hour. You can't imagine how much weight she had to lose to get in that little circle. Well, you're probably not laughing either. My students boo when I make statements like that. And, and uh, so, But at any rate, she said this is the first instance in the New Testament, at least, where uh, services of a deaf interpreter would have been welcomed. All right, now... In verse 23, it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days in which he looked upon me to take away my reproach among men. Now, The scene and the time changes. In verse 26, some five to six months later, the angel Gabriel once again uh, again appears to a human being. This time, instead of an old man in Jerusalem, it is a young girl, a virgin girl, in Nazareth, some 70 miles northwest of the city of Jerusalem. And in the sixth month, The angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou who art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. What a beautiful and well-known passages says, you know, I think one of the most important words in that passage is the word among. He does not say, blessed art thou above women, but blessed art thou among women. Will you turn now for just a moment, keeping your place there, to this same chapter, verse 47, uh, where Mary speaks these words concerning her unborn son. She says, And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. You see, the first person to call Jesus Savior was his own mother. 
Mary, godly as she was, needed to be saved. The Bible does not say, for all have sinned, with the exception, of course, of Mary, and come short of the glory of God. Mary needed to be saved also. And the angel does not say, blessed art thou above women, but blessed art thou among women. Well, verse 29, when she saw him, she was troubled that he sang and considered in her mind what manner of greetings this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. Remember that little phrase? Here it is again. Fear not. Second time it's used. For thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. You ought to tie this passage in with a very important chapter in the Old Testament. I'm referring here to verses 31, 32, and 33 in Luke 1. And the Old Testament chapter is 2 Samuel chapter 7. This chapter, verses 8 through 17, give us the Davidic covenant. Now you remember there are three important covenants in the Old Testament. There is the Abrahamic covenant, and that says that someday God will make of Abraham a mighty nation, and in part he's already done that, and will give that nation from the loins of Abraham the land of Palestine forever. So the Abrahamic covenant has to do with the land and the people. That's in Genesis 15. And then in 2 Samuel 7, we have the Davidic covenant mentioned, and this is a covenant that promises that from the loins of David, Someday a ruler shall come that will rule over, who will rule over that people in that land. And then you have the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, as you remember when we studied that passage in the Old Testament that speaks of giving those people in that land a new heart so that they will love and worship and obey that king. So here we have reference to the second of these three covenants, and the angel Gabriel reminds Mary of the Davidic covenant. And I told you, and with this we'll close this session, and we'll get into uh, the remaining part of the uh, first few verses, the last few verses in the first chapter of Luke in the next tape, but I have already told you about the four greatest days in human history. And it's interesting that in verse 33, the angel, in announcing the, the fourth greatest day, when he speaks of you're going to bear a son, also now jumps ahead in the future and predicts the greatest day from the fourth to the first, because in verse 33, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's a reference to the greatest day in human history. On this note, then, we'll end our first lecture on the gospel account.